All right, welcome back, welcome back. Give you guys some time to join in, get settled in. Welcome back on this great Super Tuesday. Thank you again for joining us. I know um, we normally meet on um, Wednesday, so we're truly appreciative of you guys coming back on a Tuesday for a very special episode of Conversations on Race and Police. So as always, I am your host, Marlo Brooks, a student, a senior at California State University of San Bernardino, where I study English in the College of Arts and Letters. Um, today, I'm also joined by my co-host, um, Dr. I mean, Mr. Stan Futch himself, um, who you'll be hearing from um, as well today. Um, so welcome back, Stan. And um, today, our conversation would be um, based around um, cops in cops on film. So we'll be watching a short film today and having um, a discussion. We're joined by some very special guests today. Our panelists, we feature uh, Dr. Howard Henderson, and we also feature uh, Dr. Frank Wilson. So um, we have a very special series episode for you guys today. And um, again, once again, thank you for returning and uh, we're gonna jump right in it. So as you know, we always start our show off with paying homage on which the ground mm -hmm. we sit on at California State University. So we recognize that California State University sits on the territory, on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the CSUSB community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution was founded in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and we will work to hold California State University of San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous people. So we thank you. And following our land acknowledgement, we'd like to keep you guys updated on recent news that's going on around the world. And um, so topics in recent news, or shall I say injustices in recent news, Jacob Blake, some of you may know, was an unarmed black man shot this past weekend. The shooting was inexcusable to begin with to R and his family's horror. Jacob was egregiously shot seven times like an animal. It's necessary to bring this up, morbid, that is, morbid as it is, and due to today's serious topic in nature, but there's also some bit of good news. Jacob Blake survives. And even though the officers who attempted to take his life were conveniently not wearing body cams, his assault was captured on camera by nearby neighbors. He lived to demand his justice and we hope to see more good news going forward from this. The family and the community are fighting with him. Now, so conversations on race and police today we are gearing up to watch a short film, Cops on Film. And um, first, let me say welcome back to our 13th episode in the series. So that's huge news. Um, you guys make it possible for us to come back each week and, and have these, these um, safe discussions, open discussions with um, students, faculty, mm -hmm. community from all over the world. So uh, we thank you again for that. And um, without further ado, we're gonna get things kicked off with our film today, Cops on Film. In the wake of the most Americans have now come to realize that the police need sweeping changes. But the question is, why has it taken so long? Why did so many people, particularly white people, think until now that police are just fine the way they are? Well, one reason is that most Americans don't actually have much actual experience with police. In fact, in a typical year, only 21% of US adults have any type of contact with police at all. So I mean, most Americans see the cops less than Trump sees Eric. So if people don't see cops in real life, how are they forming their opinions about the police? Well, a lot of it comes from the same way I form all my opinions about Klingons. Television, baby. 
Police dramas are iconic, hugely popular, and now under intense fire from activists who say these shows far too readily portray cops as good and trustworthy I never put a hand on while undermining real-life claims of systemic racism and abuse. Police not only consult on these shows, but they're also very aware that their portrayals impact public perception, and they have a vested interest in making sure that portrayal is positive. The 2015 study found viewers of crime dramas are more likely to believe the police are successful at lowering crime, use force only when necessary, and that misconduct does not typically lead to false confessions. Yes, believe it or not, watching cop shows makes a lot of people see the police as infallible. And honestly, I don't blame any of these people. I mean, I'll admit, a lot of my perceptions about reality have been shaped by TV as well. I believe sponges wear pants. I believe white people have no black friends. And most importantly, I believe that every kiss begins with K. Now, part of the reason it's easy for TV shows to convince people that cops are always right and always good at their jobs is because that's what we want to believe, right? I think we can all agree that we want people who are gonna enforce laws fairly and effectively so that we don't have to do it ourselves. I know I don't wanna do it. Like, I don't, I don't want to have to find the person who stole my car. I've got other things to do, you know? I want to go look for a new car. I don't want the stress of having to find the thief because, I mean, like, what happens when I find them? Do I arrest them? Huh? Do I throw them in prison in my apartment? Huh? Then I have to give them a job in my library and then they educate themselves and get a degree and then they turn their life around and now I'm stuck with an inspirational story in my hands? I don't need that stress. And when you watch these shows, you understand how they can shape public perception. Because according to cop shows, whenever cops are breaking the law, it's only because they have to. We can't just break protocol because we think it's right at the time and expect to get away with it. Normally, I'd agree with you. But in this case, I'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission. Well, as you well know, we will need a warrant to search the house. Agent Callan, these are exigent circumstances. You let me worry about the legal ramifications. If I need to bend the rules a little bit to get a bad guy off the street, I'm gonna do it. And you would too. Forget warrants. Forget the rules. It's on us to catch it. Ooh, that was cool. Although what that guy was actually saying is the Constitution is for pussies. It's amazing how cops and TV shows are always saying that the only way to catch a criminal is by breaking the law themselves. Technically, that cop is now a criminal too, which means another cop should kick his ass. But then that new cop is also a criminal because he's breaking the law, which means another cop should then beat up cop number two, so the third cop beats him up, then a fourth cop has to come in to beat them, then a fifth. Basically, every cop show should end with the entire precinct in a brawl while the suspect just sneaks out of the door. And you see, that, that's what cop shows are really good at doing. They make us believe that the only way the police can truly be effective is if they break the rules that society created to protect us from police. And by the way, when TV cops break the rules, it's not usually by filling form 27G instead of 27B. No, they often do it by beating the shit out of a suspect. Hi, I'm Brad Callen, and in this video, I'm gonna show you how anyone can quickly and easily create doodle videos, just like well, I told you everything. No, you haven't, but you will. I wanna beat the balls off you. Please don't let him hit me. Kyle, the only thing on this earth that's gonna stop him from hitting you is you telling the truth. <laughs> Tell us what happened, or I'm gonna do something I won't regret, not for one second. We can do this the fast way, the slow way, but then there's my Ow! Jeez, you can't, do you see that? Oh! What shot, Bones? Son of a bitch, I'm gonna fix you right now so you can't love any more kids. Come on. the right? Does it matter? You sure you didn't give him brain damage when you slammed his head against the steering wheel? Ah, oh, Captain Grove, I think brain damage was a pre-existing condition. Don't you think, George? I need to see a doctor. Whoa! All at once! Yeah! That guy doesn't deserve to see a doctor. He maybe committed a crime. And even if he didn't commit the crime, well, then this will be a lesson to stop him from committing one in the future. It's the same reason I plan to pre-beat all my children. You might not have done anything yet, but I know you will. It's actually crazy how every cop show has police just regularly using violence to help them do their job. TV doesn't do that with any other profession. There aren't medical dramas where they're like, doctor, this doesn't make any sense. 
The patient's lab work is normal, but his heart is failing. Well, maybe we need to smack him around a little bit and see what he knows. What? I used to be on a cop show. Every cop show makes it seem like the reason cops have to beat suspects is just because without the beatdown, they won't tell the truth. And so those beatings protect the rest of society from these lying criminals. But in real life, beating a suspect is a great way to get them to confess to something they didn't do, which means you've locked up an innocent person and you've let the real criminal walk free. Oh, and by the way, even if the person did do the crime, their lawyer can get them off because their confession wasn't legitimate because they were beaten. So beating a suspect to solve your case is like washing your computer with water. Yeah, the virus is gone, but so is your laptop. So whether we like it or not, TV is a powerful tool that shapes how the public sees the police, shapes how the public sees the police's role in society and how accountable they should be. Because in real life, when rogue cops throw away the rule book and take matters into their own hands, it doesn't look cool like in one of the TV shows. It looks a lot more like this. The Valdasta Police Department facing a lawsuit this morning for unnecessary and illegal force after arresting the wrong suspect and reportedly breaking his arm in the process. Put your hey, hands. What are you doing? Oh, oh my God. Oh, please. Put your I'm hands. Oh my God. That's painful body cam video showing the officers handcuffing and slamming that man to the ground. That was back in February. Antonio Smith stopped for suspicious activity and accused of panhandling, but officials had the wrong man. Smith was released at the scene. Now he's filing a $700,000 lawsuit. You see? Unfortunately, every day in America, there are people who have encounters just like that with the police. And so to all those show creators, directors, and writers in Hollywood who make these cop shows and have been tweeting that something needs to be done about the police, well, one way you can help make a difference is if you do something about the police on screen. Thank you, thank you. Um, very powerful message uh, we get to see there in that depiction of um, how officers or authority figures' perceptions are perceived here in the Americas through media. So, as I uh, mentioned earlier, and I'll welcome Dr. Howard Henderson uh, for joining, uh, we have two very um, special panelists today that we'll be speaking with. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Howard Henderson. Um, sorry, my computer keys. Dr. Here, um, Dr. Howard Henderson from Texas Southern University, and we also joined by um, Dr. Frank Wilson from Indiana State um, University, um, who will be giving their um, their expert opinions on the matters of cops and media, and cops on film, uh, and the perception that we have um, in, in the Americas today. So uh, without further ado, I want to welcome um, our first guest speaker, Dr. Frank Wilson, the author of Crime and Media Studies, um, Diversity of Method, Medium, and Communications. He's a professor of criminolo criminology and criminal justice at Indiana State University. Welcome, Dr. Wilson. Thank you. Um, I guess to begin discussing this and what we saw Trevor talking about, I'm sorry, I'm getting some echo, I'm not sure, but um, with our research, well, take a step back, with our research, we, we know through what is called cultivation theory from media studies, that unless a person has a personal experience with an issue, the police, whatever it might be, they are more susceptible to being influenced by messages through the media. Um, the more one consumes specific messaging, um, be it imagery or statements of information, the more they are likely to adopt these things as fact. We also know that the narrower the genre of consumption, when we're talking about entertainment, media, or what have you, um, the stronger the cultivation becomes. Now, even prior, to, and I reflect back to when I first started teaching crime and media at Sam Houston State University as a PhD student, um, there were some older professors that just thought, well, what's, what, what influence does the media have on criminal justice or what have you? But anybody that's taught an intro to criminal justice class knows exactly 
what kind of impact it has. It's one of the reasons we're one of the largest majors on campus, and you can usually judge what the hottest shows have been over the last few years when you talk to freshmen coming in majoring in criminology and criminal justice because they all think they're going to be a profiler, CSI, whatever the hot thing is at the time. <clears throat> But even prior to the COVID-19 lockdowns, we knew that according to Nielsen report that was issued in 2011, that uh, the average American was watching more than 34 hours of live television per week. That doesn't include recordings, that sort of thing. It was live television. So there was a high consumption of television in and of itself. Now, if you couple all of that with the fact that law enforcement related programs have accounted for 20 to 30% of programming since the 1970s, it's, it's hard to imagine that it, it, it hasn't had some sort of effect. So with our research, we examined various aspects of, police, of policing depictions in movies. We focused on movies because movies not only appear in theaters, but have often transitioned into TV series, while the reverse isn't necessarily the case. Well, it's, actually, it's rarely the case. Also, the literature generally notes that the cop film genre, as we now recognize it, um, began in 1971 with Dirty Harry. We were coming out of the late 1960s with the political unrest and everything that was going on then. And there appeared to be, a, well, not appeared to be, there was a desire to see um, more professionalism in law enforcement, more law and order type of depictions, which, you know, fed the system to where a, a dirty, dirty, hairy type of depiction was actually wanted. <clears throat> um, and also one of the key things we looked at was uh, the depiction of police use of force in the first 40 years of the cop film genre. Um, we call it the core cop film genre where, because that's where those the cop films that attempted to depict law enforcement as a real, as real as possible, no science fiction, no comedy, that sort of thing. Um, we started with Dirty Harry in 1971 and ended up in 2011, just a year before Trayvon, the Trayvon Martin case. Um, in the end, we examined over 468 police use of force scenes. In our research, we have found that the vast majority of those who are on the receiving end um, in depictions of police use of force were white males. And the majority of the police officers doing the violence are also white. Therefore, if the common person really rarely sees the depiction of African Americans being treated like this, it's essentially um, symbolically removed from their consciousness, if that makes sense. Um, arguably, you see this play out somewhat in the opinion polls um, in the immediate aftermath of the grand jury decisions not to charge officers in cases like Michael Brown and Eric Garner or the acquittal of George Zimmerman. Those polls reflected a clear um, disjuncture between African American and white citizens. The polls revealed that whites largely felt such use of force and that not charging or acquitting police officers was justified while African-Americans felt the opposite. Um, you did see the polls start to narrow in that gap with the Garner case where whites actually saw the incident take place, okay? So these entertainment media depictions of police use of force have helped to cultivate a sense of reality that does not really exist when it comes to police use of force, often resulting in a belief that certain use of force cases are rare. But with more and more real life footage being made available to the general public, uh, we have seen a public, we have seen public opinions change considerably. Last thing I want to point out is that with the cons with the canceling of shows like Cops and Live PD, it'll be interesting to see how it, and if Hollywood will, will transition. Um, but that will largely depend on the consumers, which I think is sort of what Trevor Noah in that piece was getting at. 
Um, will we stop watching our Law and Order and other Dick Wolf productions or our Lethal Weapon movies and what have you? And with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. I also felt the same way um, thinking of um, how these depictions are portrayed through media um, and create how is, you know, and over the last 50 years of the distrust that's been formed between communities and law enforcement that serve these communities. Um, you would think Hollywood would do more, media would do more to represent it in a more correct lens so that we can get back on track to what it means to protect and serve. So I thank you for offering that that piece on that and we'll definitely get back into that in the um, Q&A discussion. Um, I want to remind our guests at this time that if you have any questions for our panelists um, inside or outside of today's topic, um, any questions you may have, uh, just place them in the Q&A um, section and we would definitely um, shout you out and, and, and uh, unpack your questions for you during today's show. So we're moving on to our next guest speaker of the day. Our next panelist, where well, we're speaking to um, Dr. Howard Henderson, who is a um, founding director of the Center for Justice Research and professor of justice administration in the, Bar in the Barbara Jordan Mickey Leland School of Public Affairs at Texas Southern University. So welcome, Dr. Henderson. Let me pray. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. OK, uh, and thanks uh, for inviting me. I had a couple of technical difficulties and uh, my timer was off, so I apologize for that. Uh, Dr. Wilson uh, was texting me and I was trying to log in and hey man, it's the way it goes. We we getting ready to face a couple of hurricanes, it looks like, in the Houston area, so I apologize for that, but we're good. Um, you know, for me, man, you know, when you guys reached out and, and you want to have this conversation, um, I felt it was important that you know, we bring to the table everybody who needs to be here. And so that's why uh, Dr. Wilson's here because this is his primary area of research. Uh, I'm just a colleague who works with him on projects and, and uh, helps get him in a little trouble, uh, some good trouble, as they say. And, uh, you know, he's explained a lot about uh, the methodological know-how and, and what the results are. And for me, I was always concerned about uh, the impact of that image, which is beyond the scope of, of the research, but yet it's still a question that, that that lies underneath a lot of what we what we talk about. You know, I can speak to some of the experiences of, of, of working on this project, which I think is good to know what's happening behind the scenes. Um, when we were getting ready to publish this piece, um, the university uh, press folks uh, were going to put out a press release. Now, I think, is this the right article, Frank, am I talking about? Well, it's a different article, but the same point I'm going to make. So yeah. I saw you shaking your head. No, but I'm going to make the same No, point. that was a, that was a, we've, yeah. had a, we've had several of these. So, yeah. So, but, but let me make the point here. It, <clears throat> when you start talking about race in the media, uh, folks get skittish, right? And, and, and what we found is that when you're looking at these, the question is, is, is Hollywood trying to portray reality or vice versa, right? Which is a conversation that, that we had a lot of. And it just seemed to me um, as a criminologist that the natural assumption is that Hollywood is portraying it the way it is. Because we know there are a lot of people out there who get their reality from what they see on TV, no matter who's putting it up there. And so I was more concerned uh, with, with how you identify these issues, but also how you improve upon them. And so I want to speak a little bit about that, right? And, and then think about, you know, what are some recommendations that could come out of this research that we can use as, a, um, as an assessment to, to improve portrayal of Black police officers in the media, whatever you want to portray. Uh, from, a, from an accuracy standpoint. Uh, for me, uh, this project was just a project in a series of projects. Uh, again, that Dr. Wilson spearheaded and, and, and he so graciously pulled me along in, but it was all about how you stop portraying black people in the media 
this way, right? When you think about it, it's like, wait a minute. Um, where did you get these depictions from? Who told you that this was okay, right? Uh, why are you doing it this way? The, all these questions made me start thinking about, okay, who was the advisor? Who was the black advisor that they had on this movie, or on these movies? Who was the one they were talking to? And so then I started thinking, well, how do you fix that problem? And how do we get accurate black police portrayals, accurate, accurate black portrayals, period, across the board? And how do we align that accuracy with Hollywood making more accurate decisions? How does that work? How does that function? And so that would require Hollywood to do the same thing that we're asking police departments to do. They were asking other entities in society to begin to align their practices with reality. So to me, Hollywood is suffering from the same problem that you suffer from in other institutions in our society. This was just another example of that. The danger here, though, is that you're talking about a system where we need police officers to be fair, just, and to be seen as they are. So let me move to my next point. If I'm a Hollywood executive and I don't know that what I'm doing is inaccurate, how do I find out that I'm inaccurate? Who's going to tell me I'm being inaccurate, right? So we have a fundamental flaw in this system where if I'm doing something, no one holds me accountable for being accurate. Is, is Dr. Wilson going to send me an email and say, hey, man, uh, I saw your movie. You just spent $20 million on your own. Am I going to then revert course and do the right thing at that point? I'm not going to do that. And so I, I became very sensitive to, is this just another academic exercise or are we going to be able to actually do something with it? And, and, and that's one of my major criticisms of academia is that we do a whole lot of work that no one ever really gets a chance to use to make a difference in people's lives. And so, you know, looking at this conversation, my challenge to everyone that is, uh, I think there are 84 people that are part of this conversation, is how do we take these conversations that you guys are having on a weekly basis, I'm thinking every week, how do you take it from this conversation to move it to uh, uh, actuality? Because you spend a lot of time putting this together. You spend a lot of time recruiting people to participate in these conversations. But then we leave the conversation and all we can say is that we're informed, right? How do we take that information and say, okay, whatever the issue was that we talked about for the hour, hour and a half, whatever time we had, how do we take that understanding and move it to reality? How do we help Hollywood? How do we help media folks know that what they're doing, what they're showing us is inaccurate? Because there are a lot of people that will have conversations. There are going to be some great conversations during this session. But we got to move that from the conversation piece to the actual portrayal of people in the media. So I'm, I'm going to move to this point. Somebody's got to create a way where we have real time systematic analysis. I'll give an example. You have these media ratings that come out and say, okay, well, a million Americans watch this, or, you know, 40% of the people who watch this show look like this. Marlo, I'm going to ask you, you can just shake your head. Have you ever been participating in the media study? Just shake your head yes or no. You don't have to answer, shake your head yes or no, right? Uh, what I'm saying is, who are they talking to? And so how do we fix that? And so I want to move from this research to actually begin, because the timing is right right now for us to begin to press people to change the narrative and be more accurate in what they're portraying because we can't afford for people to be receiving the wrong message and no one not give a warning about it, right? If I'm watching a, a, a commercial about a drug, half the commercial is about the unintended consequences of that drug. If I'm watching a movie that, that's false, no one ever says, well, 
you know what? You just watched the whole movie and spent 20 bucks and, and half of the stuff we're talking about is not even real. You, you got to do that. We just saw a president tell people that they could drink bleach and they drunk bleach. Right. So, so, so media is powerful. And, and what I'm saying is, you know, look at the articles that, that are out there, look at the work that we're doing, but be thinking to yourself, how do we take it from this theoretical concept and, and these practical realities and begin to change from our local television shows to Hollywood execs? Listen, I have never emailed a Hollywood producer. Maybe I need to get off this phone call and email Hollywood and say, you know what, I watched, I watched Django and it, the way you portrayed that wasn't the way it should be. Or I watched In the Heat of the Night, that was wrong. If we begin to do this kind of work, then I think we begin to change the narrative. One of the best books I've ever read in my entire life was by Earl Afari Hutchinson's book on the assassination of the black male image. That book made me reevaluate the way in which I saw media, the way in which I saw the news, because I was forced to begin thinking about whether or not what I saw was real. And that's what this is about. It's saying, look, here's what Hollywood's showing you. Here's what's real and unpacking all of that. Now, you know, Frank has been doing this work. Dr. Wilson's been doing this work, man, probably what, 15 years or so? You would say 16, 15. We need more people in this space. We need more people to ask the right questions, but we also need people to press the folks that are in positions of authority and power to begin to make these changes because the perception or the misperception of who we are as a people is costing people's lives. At the end of the day, if we really think about it, this is not just a matter of me thinking that the police officers portrayed the wrong way. It also goes into the respect that I give that individual or the lack thereof. It also goes into our whole understanding about who a people are. And so I think that if we're able to deconstruct that and demystify that for its accuracy, then we get better information coming across our screen. But the last point I wanna make here is this. When we think about the portrayal of, of black officers in the media, we also have to deal with the reality of the black officer, right? When you watch these TV shows, most of these black officers were portrayed as comedians, as jokes, as far, am, am I right, Dr. Wilson? They yeah, the, the research he's talking about was a paper we did a few years back that dealt with the depiction of African-American police officers. I spoke earlier about the police use of force paper we did. So what he's talking about, they, the movies, what we found is they, when, they depict, when they depicted an African-American police officer, they were depicted either as a joke or and or a sellout to their own community. Right, and, so, and, go ahead. And, and so for me, that's troubling because if, if, if I'm a college professor and I'm training future criminal justice employees, a lot of whom will go on to be police officers and the media portrays them as a joke, don't nobody want a job as a comedian? Well, there are some people who want jobs as comedians but I am dare say that most of my students did not come to college to, take a, to look for a job that's gonna be seen as a joke or a comedian. And so I think at the end of the day, we have to do a better job of making sure that what we're watching on TV is accurate because that accuracy means a lot. And we all come from people who have not been respected, their authority is not respected, their position is not respected, and it's danger in that. Because the accuracy of the portrayal, I think, is, is what really matters. And I'll, I'll, I'll get off of that. But I, I, my point here is this. We have to be systematic about taking what we find in this research and moving it to another level where we can actually make substantive changes for people in this society. I thank you as well, Dr. Anderson, for those words. Um, we often gather as resident and community members um, or city hall meetings and attempts to hold our um, city officials um, accountable for their actions um, upon the city and the communities. But um, we, we, I rarely see that in, in Hollywood and in media where we hold them accountable for the depictions that they, they place. So, um, and as well as the influence that it may have on the viewers itself, you know, if I'm, if I'm always depicted in media as um, poor and, you know, from, from um, 
from un, unequally, un, unequal communities and, and things like that, then this is all I'm going to settle for. Why even reach for the stars if, if this is what it looks like, you know? So I can only imagine the influence that it puts on us. And feel free, definitely, um, Mr. Fudge, Stan Fudge, uh, my co-host today, um, to join in on that. Um, we see that a lot here just in San Bernardino, California. Um, the, the unrest and unjust and uh, just the, uh, the quality of life that's, that's been placed upon us for, for decades in just San Bernardino itself. San Bernardino um, County, one of the largest counties in the nation, the largest county in the nation itself with um, what, the number three um, standing in the nation for, for crime. So when we think about these type of things, um, I can only imagine the influence that um, what, they, what we once were speaking on was music but now we have to heavily, you know, put our foot into what what's being projected into our homes as well and into our communities as well. So I thank you for speaking on that too. Yeah. I'm not a fan of the police uh, uh, movies. Are you getting feedback? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I'm I'm a fan of police movies, and, and uh, both both speakers had real really good points. And 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 uh, Frank, you mentioned that. Um, majority of the people killed by uh, uh, white cops were white uh, perpetrators. And, but at the same time, if you looked at the perpetrators that were being killed, now go back to Dirty Harry. The, the, in the first Dirty Harry, the, the guy kidnapped a young girl, murdered her in the worst way, and then, then he got a bus full of kids. And at, at the end of the show, he died. And he, you know, he's been shooting him you know, and killing him. At the same time, you look at Get Out, and at the end of the movie, something you never see is a white woman getting killed. But she was, but both, both times it happened, they were the worst people they could be. That in everybody's eyes that were watching those movies and those shows, you wanted that person dead. That person deserved to be dead. Where at the same time, when you look at the normal shows, and I, and I will say this here, PD Live, for the first time I saw white people being treated the same as black people on a TV show. And so I kind of liked that show, but at the same time, they still hassled the brothers and they still hassled, you know, the uh, you know, majority of the people they were pulling over were, were black. So to me, they were profiling still, but at least I saw some white folks getting arrested and getting treated poorly. And I saw some black folks that were given a break, you know, you know, my brother always used this term, give me the white boy deal. And I saw some brothers getting the white boy deal. And I thought that was pretty cool on, on uh, PD Live. And so I was kind of disappointed that went off the air. But all cop shows, another one I love is 48 Hours. But who do you see on 48 Hours? Brothers. Brothers killing brothers. And, and I think one of the things the media really loves to do is show us in our worst way. And that's a shame. And I think uh, uh, Dr. Henderson put it right. Who were they talking to? Who were they asking, is this the way we should portray you or portray the, the boys in the hood? And, and they're not. They're not asking anybody. So they're just doing their own thing. And then, like he said, when they get brother, you know, Chris Rock, a cop, and he's a comedian. That's why he's playing that role. They want that, that satire. But the bottom line is, like Dr. Howard said, they need to have us involved as they put their movies together so they can be more realistic, more realistic about you know, who they're pointing the finger at. Because you know? if, if you're in a good neighborhood, the crime in your neighborhood is, so, is low. It's, it's almost none. But if you want to find some, some cr cr crime, like PD Live or 48 Hours, you can find crime. Like you said, San Bernardino's got major issues with gangs and black-on-black and -black crime. So if you want to find crime, they talk about Chicago all the time. You can find crime. But the bottom line is, is if you're going to portray it on TV, at least be fair and accurate about it. Thank well, I think... If, if I might interject something, uh, I think the scary part about this, if we really think about it, music, movie, 
And television executives, they're not mo necessarily motivated by doing the right thing. They're motivated by the dollar and they're motivated by who watches these. So for those shows to even be on TV or in the movies, those depictions, there's an audience out there that, that wants to see that sort of portrayal, which is more disturbing to me in a lot of ways. Um, I think I'm gonna read a quote here. James Baldwin, back in the day, 1960, I think is when this came through. Uh, he stated, these movies are not, these movies are designed not to trouble, but to reassure. They do not reflect reality. They merely, merely rearrange its elements into something we can bear. They also weaken our ability to deal with the world as it is, ourselves as we are. So even back then, I think he was on top of this issue more than most people are. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. And you did mention that earlier about the consumer. And I find it so hard to agree that it's the consumer that builds this, um, this platform for the need of this type of um, behavior in Hollywood. Um, as much as I see it as almost an, a narrative being placed upon or an objective they have for what should be placed on, on television and um, in the minds and in the homes um, of their consumers, what should be placed out there. Um, we know this nation's history on the projectile of fear unto its um, citizens and, and you know, that's the authoritarian, authoritari uh, and I'm probably saying the word wrong, but that's the, 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 the stance here in the Americas is um, almost in that dictator form of what it is to be an American citizen. You know, um, follow the head of house. You know, and uh, it's not as brutal as other countries where you can't speak against your nation's leader and things of that nature. But uh, it's it's in the sense of what we feel, the people in these leadership positions, what we feel is best for our our our, our citizens. So when you break that down to our local level and such, um, you know, because I, I speak a lot on local level because I feel it's frank that we focus on the immediate, what we can affect immediately versus um, things that we can, that's, and I think that the, you know, the immediate effect will trickle up to the nation, you know, it'll cover that side, but once we get the right people in office locally and the right people in leadership locally, that's the only place we can start. That's the only place we can start. We can start in home. It's the, and it, you don't have to be a, a politician. You can be someone that's up on current events, and you spread that word to your neighbor. You spread that word to your siblings. You, and we we just it's a it's a it's a fashion of mentorship almost that this country needs in order to survive. That these communities need in order to thrive. So all of these measures, all of these these stands that stances that you guys are taking are very deeply important. To our um, to our, our viewers, to our to our nation, and I'm just glad you guys are speaking on them. You definitely opening my eyes to more parts of it that that need to that we need to redirect our energy to. And um, Mary, I see you chiming in. You have something yeah. to add. Thank you, Marlo. Um, I just uh, uh, I think Dr. Henderson was talking about the, who composes, or maybe I wanted to hear this, and I don't know, but. Uh, who are the writers? Who are the writers in Hollywood? And so I was curious myself and just looked it up. The Writers Guild of America, you know, who tell us about the world, 92% white. 92% white. That has a huge, huge effect on what we see. And many of them have not lived among African Americans or Latinos. And so they go to the, you know, they, they lean into those stereotypes. And that's what we find uh, in these shows. But my question, uh, there, there have been two significant things in media that have happened since the killing of George Floyd. One was the cancellation of cops, which was an American, uh, you know, an, an American icon, right? Cops. Uh, that was canceled almost immediately. And then the the lost episode, or what I call the lost episode of Blackish, 
which was uh, in season four, it was not uh, shown uh, because of quote unquote um, uh, creative differences between the the uh, the producer um, uh, Kenya Barris and um, and the you know the the big Hollywood executives. Uh, so that was not shown, and it ha it just happened to have the content of um, Colin Kaepernick uh, and uh, doing his protest. And there was one other uh, really controversial thing. But I'm wondering if you all want to comment on, uh, on those things. I can, I can uh, make a comment. I, let me preface that saying that when you think about what's in the media or what's been taken out, you have to put that in the context of knowing that what you see on TV and what you see in the media affects you and it affects you, uh, your life choices, life's expectations, right? I mean, I think it was in uh, 2011, I think it was the uh, it was a study of media representation and and the impact of, of lives of black men. And they found that uh, essentially uh, negative uh, mass media portrayals were strongly related to lower life expectations among black men, okay? And in those portrayals, they, the media constantly reinforces the same narrative of black men, right? Athletic, rapper, those are really the only two use or or criminal, right? Those are the three you see every day in the news, right? Uh, if you look at ESPN, I mean, it, ESPN reminds me of a a slave market on TV, okay? Because the conversation always is about how fast he or she is. Uh, how much they've changed since the last time that you saw them, uh, what team they're being traded to, just the vernacular used in that space is just, it's a throwback to me to, you know, the the days in which we were in shackles physically and we knew it and, and, and that was the way it was. When you look at the media backlash that led to taking cops off TV, right? I wonder if that's more symbolic of a realization that was always there, but now you know you got to do, so this is what you do, as opposed to actually changing policies and laws that keep situations like what we've been going through since the end, since police and blacks became introduced to each other, we've had these problems. So this is not new, but I think that a lot of what we're seeing is symbolic, right? They, people know it's the right thing to do, but they don't actually change any laws and policies to keep it from happening again. And so I think that they could take, they could take all of it off TV but until they change the local communities, I think Marlo mentioned this about these issues being local, until they change that narrative, they could take off what, because they're only giving us on TV three types of black people, right? I mean, that's all you got. And, and, and black people, as we all know, are more dynamic than three types, right? I mean, that's just a fact. When, when you think about, um, when you think about picking up a newspaper, all right? If a black man makes a front page of the newspaper, he's either going to jail, a professional athlete that's done something that people think is all, he scored 60 points, <laughs> you know, we don't see black men like Marlo, we don't see Stan, they don't make the front page of the paper, right? Uh, 
I've been on the front page of the paper, but I got a PhD. I'm a black man in the South, right? That's like a dinosaur. And I, I think that in order for the media to pay attention to us, we got to be extraordinary in their eyes in terms of criminal, which is not true because that's a small proportion of blacks who do commit crime, but that's another. The reality of everyday black people, we don't see in the, in the news. But what I will say, and I'll, I'll leave you with this point, <clears throat> the distortions are there, and I think they speak more to the subconscious reality than people want to admit. Right, they just don't know in a lot of cases that, but it, but it tells you a lot. And I'll, I'll give an example and I'll leave you with this. I had a puppy that I raised from, from the age of like six weeks old. And like the typical black household, the typical black household, there weren't many white people who would come in and out of our house. And when that dog saw a white person, he would go nuts. Okay. And I realized, say, hey, wait a minute. This dog is telling on me. I need to train this dog. This dog needs some diversity. Okay. I'm just being honest. That's the way it goes. And that's how people are, right? When we don't associate with people of other groups, when all we see on TV is the perception of what black people should be like, that's the way we govern our affairs with that group of people, right? Uh, and, and Hollywood and, and media, all the way down to the local news, they have a function, a role to play in this space. And if anybody's going to help diversify people's perspectives, the news can do it. Blackish, I think, was a great example of a, a of an approach to try to do that, but it wasn't the Cosby show, right? Now I'm gonna say Cosby because I like the Cosby show. I'm not supporting what he's done lately, but I like the Cosby show. I thought it had a function in society. Uh, the different world had a function in society, right? We don't have TV shows like that anymore, right? What we have is we all turn our local news tonight, we're gonna see black men going to jail we're going to see black men playing basketball in Orlando in the bubble, right? We're going to see that. And then dare that black man come out and say something socially conscious, he gets criticized. Laura Ingram told LeBron James to shut up and play basketball, right? So if you're not doing what people think you should be doing, you get outside of that narrative, you're, 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 you don't know your place anymore. And we all know where that your place anymore conversation began. And I think we need to, begin to have more and more of these conversations because they're necessary. And I, and I agree. And I, and yeah. I was going to say, one of the things I do believe, I don't think it's the consumer who's setting the trend. I think it's the writer. I think the writers are writing the stories and they are selling because there's nothing else to be sold. So when you have a, when you're portraying a black man as, criminals or athletes or some, they have to be somebody Superman, you find that I don't think it's a consumer that's want, that wants to see that misunderstood mis, uh, black man. I think it's the writer who's doing it. I'll now give you a good example. Black Panther came out. Whoa, completely different than anything we've ever seen. And what did it do? Boom, it was great. So I don't think it's the the uh, consumer who is setting the trend. I truly believe it's the writer setting the trend. And, and like Dr. Howard said, we need to set the tone by letting them know we don't appreciate being uh, misrepresented and, and, and displayed poorly. And, and they need to listen. And until that happens, it's going to be the same, the same thing. And, and, and I truly believe it's not the consumer. Yeah, I, th I think, and thank you for your, your response, Dr. Henderson. Um, most people don't know one of Spike, uh, to me, the best Spike Lee film ever is Bamboozled. And, uh, and I think the message there, getting back to what Stan is saying, is that it is, uh, and it, it, it usually, it's around entertainment and, and, um, and rap, 
hip hop. And uh, the, the bottom line with these, um, these portrayals that we, you know, with, uh, black women being called bitches and hoes and all that in rap, that is not necessarily the, the decision of the artist. It is the decision of the music producers. It is the decision of the music executives who keep sending them back and saying, we want something harder. We want it harder, right? And so I think you're right, Stan, in that these decisions are not being made by the consumer of music or the consumer of, um, uh, of, of media in general, but by someone who is pretty much invisible. You know, we have these invisible hands in media who are making these decisions about black women traipsing around in music videos with barely no clothes on. And, uh, and, and, and the, the concentration on, um, on, on money and drugs and hoes and, and so forth. It's not, it's not the consumer. It is, it's not even the artist who's making those decisions. Well, Robert Townsend did Hollywood Shuffle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was all about just that. It was, <laughs> they told him he wasn't black enough. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? And then the white guy started talking and he talked more black than the black man did. And they were, yeah, that's what <laughs> we need. That's what we need. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I, you're right on track, uh, uh, Dr. Tessera. Thank you guys for that addition. Um, at this time in our show, we're definitely going to open up um, our Q&A market and um, get a chance to answer some of our viewers' questions on today's um, topic. So um, one of the very first ones came in from Christine, um, and it, it was talking about um, how did you get Hollywood to care about the correct portrayal versus making money? And, and Dr. Texera, uh, weeks ago, you know, it always came back down to that bottom dollar, that American dollar. Uh, so, how do we get the betrayal corrected versus the 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 figure of money? It, it always comes back down to money. If I if I can start with that, um, when I was saying it was the consumer, what I was trying to what I was getting at is that if there is a portrayal that is not appropriate or is inaccurate, we need to simply stop watching it because when that show doesn't get viewers then it it's going to disappear although i was surprised cops still existed when they when they canceled it i would be interested to see if there hadn't already been a decision coming down the line that they were going to cancel it anyway and then they cancel it to make it you know make themselves look good so so i, I just wanted to throw that in there with regards to this thank you um but anybody can ask if you would like uh, when it comes down to that mighty dollar um, which always wins the undefeated mighty dollar, but I, and and I think um, Dr. Wilson, you just said it. It's, it's it's choosing what we choose to digest when it comes to the media. Um, is how we, uh, Christine, in the um, in the comments in the Q and A, is probably the, the the most appealing way to to portray to get ourselves portrayed in the media um, um, more correctly and, and more diversely as well. I say that is for the individual. Your power is there. Um, but to what Mary and Stan were saying, I don't think we're going to see the changes in the depictions or what have you until you see more diversity in the entertainment industry, period. I mean, what did you say the number of writers, Mary? 92%. What was the percentage? 92% uh, are white. Are white, yeah. Yeah, 92%. And that's, that's I, just I, I unacceptable. Absolutely. But I think it's also, if you think about any social movement that has occurred in the United States, it's always come from the bottom up, as you're suggesting, Frank. Uh, but it's also, I mean, if we had taken uh, a, a poll in the South, should African Americans get the right to vote, it would have lost, right? Because, um, uh, so it had to be the demand from you know this small group of people, African Americans, and sometimes not so small, uh, in the South, uh, with our leaders listening to us, and you know threatening the vote or or whatever whatever the case might be, 
um, and, and getting getting back to what you were saying, um, Dr. Henderson, about uh, about change. You know, this is and and you know we began these conversations three months ago, uh, saying that they're going to be more than conversations. We need to get people in here who are going to talk about policy change, and that's what the West Side Action Group is all about. That's what uh, many of our school administrators that we've had on have been all about is change. Uh, because we can talk until the cows come home, but how do how do we effect effectuate change uh, around this idea of policing? Well, we got to hold our our our, uh, our politicians. We got to hold their feet to the fire. Uh, you know, we're not going to uh, to to do put band aids on policing. We're going to restructure policing. That's the goal. It's not going to be. Uh, you know, we're going to fix this and we're going to fix that, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about restructuring it and we've been kicking around a lot of ideas about that and very, very serious. And I think there are these little pods all over the United States now. And unfortunately, the police keep giving us more fuel to, to underscore what we're, what we're talking about here. You know, we, we pay these people, sometimes big money. And, uh, and, and they keep doing the same old stuff. So what do you do? You hit them in the pocketbook, right? Uh, yeah. you, you make sure that, um, that, you know, you defund. And by that, you know, you know what we mean. You, we don't mean totally no, no cops, but, you know, I don't, I don't need uh, an armed, a heavily armed uh, two police officers come to my house to take a burglary report. I don't need that. Uh, I don't need, uh, you know, even even domestic violence, as long as no weapons are involved. I don't need cops to do that. I don't even need cops to give traffic tickets, traffic enforcement, right? I see you're uncomfortable with that, Howard. No, I'm not uncomfortable with that. I'm very comfortable with that. Uh, so much so I was going to give you a hug to the screen. Uh, <laughs> I, I think you, I agree totally with what you said. Um, I think that you know, the the purchasing power. Uh, I think at most recent count, there are a little over 47 million blacks in this country. Uh, I think that when you think about uh, the 1.1 trillion dollars that we spend, um, I think that when you think about the fact that we spend more money on we outspend people on things like soap. Um, grooming we 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 outpace people on a lot of products we gotta but, smell good we gotta smell good we gotta look good <laughs> we also believe in paying extra for items that convey images that look like us right and nilson has shown this every time they put out a report on our spending dollars if you make your product appeal to us, we buy it and we'll spend more money for it than any other group in, in this society. Um, we are influenced by the staff in a store. We are influenced by in-store advertising. We are influenced by merchandising. Um, we dominate the ethnic hair care market. We dominate the whole notion of branding for social causes. Um, we dominate celebrity designing. I mean, there's so many things that I think that we don't understand collective power, but I think that goes back to our plantation experience. And we were never taught that it doesn't matter if we don't speak the same language. We share a similar condition and we're able to unite to begin to force democracy to respond to our request. And we have yet to this very day figured out how to ensure that the constitution applies to us. And as you said, we, we have to hold our politicians accountable. We have to hold our religious leaders accountable. Mm -hmm. We have to hold our academics accountable. We have to hold our athletes accountable. We have to hold our white friends accountable. Go ahead and smile, Frank. We have to hold, every, even ourselves, we have to hold accountable. 
And I think that we're going to have to figure out at some point that what we're asking for, we've never seen it. So at what point are we going to sit down and draw the map? Because we've never done that. We've never said, let's sit down and lay out what this should look like and how we get there. So we have been fighting for advances in respective spaces, but we've never seen the Wakanda. We've never seen the place where we want to get to. We don't know what it looks like. Even when you're mentioning policing, what if defunding doesn't fix it? Because there are some people who say it doesn't matter what you do with the police, they will create an institution to overlay that to control you. And so those are the, what are our contingency plans? And so I think I am with you. I think a reallocation, figuring out what, I think we need more social workers in policing. I think we need more people who understand conflict resolution in policing. I think we need something other than what we already have because what we have isn't working. My fear is just whatever we create is going to reform itself into what we got rid of. And so I just don't think we've clearly articulated what we want to see, but, but at least we're having the conversation. You know, right, I think, and, and, and I'm sorry, can we rule out training? Because well, you know, uh, when the, the, way, the way police patrol white areas, you know, they don't need any extra training for that. And so we should, yeah. we should probably ask for the white treatment whenever a cop comes to our house or something, right? I think you're absolutely right. I don't think training is the issue. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It's the excuse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, I think that if black communities were policed while, like white communities, we would see very well-trained police. Let's just be honest. Even black police are trained well. Mm -hmm. Numbers, right? We, we looked at data from the city of Houston Police Department, the police shootings. Black police officers rarely shoot people, right? And they have the same training, they work the same jobs, and they experience more discrimination on the job. Mm -hmm. But they shoot significantly less than, any, than anyone else. How can they do it? So I don't think it's a training thing. I think it's a personality flaw. Yeah. I, I think it's a matter of who we choose to be in these positions to work. I think we choose people who have authoritarian personality styles. I think there's so many. So I think it's a hiring problem. I, I think it's a cultural problem. Um, when you when you think about, um, for example, we saw recent cases in Texas where border patrol agents were abusing the migrant workers who were coming across the border. That's the person. I don't care who you are. If 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 I'm a border patrol agent, I am not going to abuse anybody coming across the border. I don't care what kind of directive I got from top. We all have worked jobs and we all have done, have not done something we were told to do because we disagree with it. So if you follow orders that I know are unethical, then that tells me a lot about you. <laughs> so I think we need to begin to have these conversations and hold people personally accountable and not allow them to say they need more training. Eh, okay. I was on a panel last week and, and it was interesting. I heard um, black officers and they said that one of the biggest problems isn't the training. They said the problem is, is when that person walks through the door, they are already have ideas of what, who they are. They are who they are. Right. And, and, and I think that's, that's very true. I also think that um, a lot of the questions are about um, uh, teach, telling the media, let's see, what did it say here? Let me get one of the questions. For the media to have to be uh, told that they have to regulate, you know, regulate the information the media is spreading, and make sure that the media, the information they're spreading is is accurate. And and I don't think that's ne necessary. I think what Dr. Henderson is saying is very necessary, and that is is if you take a look at what the Black Panther made in their revenues. Wow, it was huge money, and they're still making money today. And they and they're getting ready to release the second one, and it and it's made, it made so much money. So so the fact of the matter is, is if you hit them in their pocketbooks, in other words, they start putting stuff out that's more accurate, and people go to see the more accurate depiction of of themselves, and so on. 
the funds are going to come in. They're going to, they, but they have to have people on scene that are telling them a black man would never do that. He would never run behind the chainsaws when the guy is trying to kill him. He wouldn't do it, <laughs> you know? And, and, and so the bottom line is, is it, we need to have people in the game to correct the game. I, I think also, uh, uh, writers operate like dictators and they need to operate more like socialists or, or, or in a democracy, right? Because as you pointed out earlier, and I, I think uh, Dr. Wilson pointed this out as well, they shouldn't be able to just sit down and write and present a story without any support that their story is accurate. There, there should be uh, fact checkers to make sure that what they're saying is, is, is on point. I think I responded to one of the uh, individuals who uh, so graciously is participating in the conversation in the chat and, and their comment was, do I believe that Hollywood talking to one person is enough? No, I don't. I don't agree with that because black people like white people like Asian, are, 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 are very heterogeneous, right? And I, I would be okay with them just talking to somebody though, right? Because I think talking to somebody is better than talking to nobody and making an assumption that you're actually portraying everybody. And I think that's, we, we just gotta get away from that, but we all understand it. I mean, there's the, the, maybe the way Hollywood is set up, uh, they're able to get away with doing it, obviously, because they keep doing it. Um, they're not held accountable. Um, I just think that, you know, these types of conversations are necessary to get people to begin thinking about how we strategically align ourselves with change. So. And I would throw in, Stan, to your point with regards to the writers and everything. There are probably writers out there that are writing material that is accurate and whatnot, but there are decision makers within these within the industry, we'll just say, that determine whether your writing reaches the screen or not. So I, to I totally agree, because like Mary said, you know, half these rappers, you know, a guy puts out a clean rap song and the, and the industry says, what? What is that? Go back to your old self, you know, Dr. Dre came back and first thing he came back, instead of doing a, a smooth rap like he's been, was doing, he came back gangster. And it's like, that's, that, that's, that's what they wanted. That's what he believed they wanted. But the truth of the matter is, I don't think people want what people think they want. No, just quit thinking for me. You know, you come out with a, with a, a nice, you know, uh, smooth uh, R&B song, and I'm happy. You know, I don't necessarily have to have, and I like rap. I like, I listen to rap. I like rap, you know, because they got some good ideas. Brother says, don't buy no $80,000 car before you buy a house. That's a good, that's something that's good to be been said, but I don't need to have, hear about bitches and hoes. And so I think you're right. The decision makers, and, and you're right. It could be not the writers because it could be the decision makers. I have nieces and nephews that are book, uh, have written books and, and they're doing very well. And their books are not, they're very well done. If it's going to be made a movie, the only way it's going to be made a movie is Oprah Winfrey gets a hold of and says, I want that to be a movie. So her, she's a decision maker. But the other decision makers aren't making those, those positive decisions. And I think I agree with you, um, Dr. Wilson. And I, I've, I've been around long enough to have had, uh, growing up in LA, seven channels on the television and three or four uh, uh, rock and roll stations. And I remember, you know, watching ballet on television because that's all there was and started to enjoy ballet or I love Lucy or, or um, you know, so, so we consume what is given to us. And I think young people today don't realize that there's more out there than this hardcore gangster rap. And uh, maybe there is a place for it. Maybe I'm seen as an old fogey for but you know, our consumption, you know, just like food, put something in, 
uh, you know, it's going to have an effect on you. It's going to have an effect on your psyche, on your on your brain waves, on whatever. And um, and so I think you know, ballet didn't hurt me. I love Lucy didn't hurt me. Uh, you know, the Donna Reed show didn't hurt me. Um, and so I think, uh, I don't know what the answer is. I do know that there has to be, and I, you know, this is a trigger word for me, diversity, you know, cause I think, you know, it's much more than that, but I think that it, it would be interesting to see 50% of the writers in Hollywood being people of color, you know, well, Latinos, uh, African-Americans, mm -hmm. sorry. One of the problems, Mary, is we, we're dealing with, like Dr. Howard said, you know, if we could coll collectively got all together, all, every black person in the United States and demanded different things as a collective, we might make, be able to make a difference. But when you talk about, you know, the, the, the rap song, the number one rap song that actually made it to number one was by Vanilla Ice. All them brothers have been rapping for years, but yet Vanilla Ice's rap song goes to number one before any of the brothers' rap songs do. And so what I'm saying is, is collectively, we could make a difference. But the bottom line is, if you look at the numbers, we have 7%, some places have 10%, some places have even 11%. But 11% doesn't make the rules. And that's where the problem, I think, lies. Um, the next question I'm gonna, I hope I'm, you guys can hear me. Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, cause I had a, a different screen up. Um, the next question I'm going to go into, um, is coming from an anonymous member of the, of the attendees tonight. Um, but it spoke on, um, law enforcement officers see the worst of people in their darkest times, um, which caused law enforcement officers to either have emotional issues or desensitize themselves with things that they see. So the media doesn't really depict that in any of their shows, which is correct. You don't see the, the breakdown of the psyche of the, the officers that respond to these calls in these different communities. But um, law enforcement officers are required to attend psychological meetings when they are involved in life and death situations, but everything else is up to the officer to see, the, see support. And um, Dr. Uh, Texera, you spoke about this um, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, um, how do you propose um, how do you propose change in that line of thinking? And uh, Dr. Tessera, I think you were speaking on um, bias training, things like that, um, other forms of, because um, you're right, you're the only time the, the officer really seeks any psychological help is when it's like an officer involved shooting and things of that nature, but um, others are, and, and it's not open to the public if so. Um, it's not for public um, knowledge, um, the officer's um, psyche when it comes to everyday life on the job and how, can, how that can uh, potentially affect them. Officers are on the job for decades and, and you know, retire from the job and how does, what does that say about their record on their way out the door and, and how they've handled cases and things like that. So, I mean, anybody can speak on that as well. I think that goes to individual departments. Sorry, I was getting some feedback there. Um, I think it was some in, it goes to individual departments too and the culture within those departments and how that's established and how it is perpetuated and continues on. Um, I'm a big, you know, Howard will tell you that I'm a big pro pro proponent of uh, using brain science to determine when officers should be hired. We know the, the human brain doesn't fully develop till age 26 or 27, somewhere around there. Some would argue a little later. Um, but uh, anytime I've talked to a police chief, and, I, and I'll, I'll ask, I'll say, what is your ideal candidate? And almost every time they come back, someone a little older with, a little, with some more tools in their toolkit, something to that effect. And essentially, they're saying someone older that's more developed and can resist being indoctrinated into doing things. And as Dr. Henderson was saying with regards to the the border officers be more willing to say, hey, no, I'm not going to go along with what you're doing. So that's my thought. And, and uh, Dr. I, Henderson also said that uh, and I, on one of his interviews, uh, which I liked a lot, was the officers being hired should have education. And I think they should. And the reason why I think they should is, and it, it's not going to change the cost of living for, for the, the cities if a guy walks in with education, 
if you look at the salary for um, LAPD, uh, the first salary is 56K a year, but it goes up to 156K a year. So they're paying those, those, those uh, individuals good money to do their job. So I think if they came in educated, they'd, uh, they would have also gone through classes that gave them information that's so vital to the job. Like uh, Dr. Howard said, uh, psych classes, classes that could help them interact with people on a daily basis in a better way. I, I'm glad you brought that point up because um, you know, I've been pushing that because the research supports it, and <laughs> period. And you raised a point that I hadn't really thought about, but they're already being paid college degree wages, <laughs> right? You and, got that right. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as a matter of fact, I know they probably make more than most social workers. Uh, most probation officers, most parole. I mean, ask me because I know that's what I used to do. But uh, I just don't understand. Well, I do understand because I think that policing is one of those entryway jobs into uh, society, like education, like teaching, right? And so uh, there's this fear that you're going to close off another opportunity for people to climb the uh, socioeconomic ladder in this country when you lock out individuals who don't have uh, college degrees. But I think that if you have a person who is uh, able to serve as the judge and the jury and their constitution is protected in that decision, they should have obtained a certain level of education that we know you can critically think uh, among people who think differently than you. Uh, and, and I know there are some good police officers who don't have college degrees. And listen, there are some good people everywhere but there are some occupations that just demand it. And I think policing is, is one of those places. Um, but I think another issue that we have to talk about is where do we go from here? Like, <laughs> like what do we do? We see all of these um, nuances in our society that we, that we just talk, talk move right on past it. But, but the implications of this, though, is, is, is serious. Right? And some of this stuff is life and death. We just saw in, in was it Wisconsin, two days ago, uh, the young brother was, was, was shot, uh, what, seven times for, for walking to his own vehicle with his kids in the car. Um, I, I think it was Supreme Court Justice Taney in the Dred Scott decision that said that a Black man has no rights to what your white man is bound to respect. Uh, we're still dealing with that. Um, I mean, we're talking about Hollywood not getting it right. But even if Hollywood got it right, we'd still have problems. Because the getting right is still problematic, right? I mean, it's, so we got issues that are so many layers deep that until we continue these conversations, we don't get to unpack that onion the way it needs to be unpacked. So. I, I too had a former profession, um, Dr. Henderson, and that was a cop, and which is why I became so interested in the sociology of policing. Um, and I can I can pretty much guarantee that after that young man got shot in Wisconsin by one police officer, when they went back to the station, I guarantee you that those other police officers were going to be questioned about why they didn't shoot too, rather than con being congratulated for constraint. They're they're going to be um, they're going to be chastised for not uh, participating in that in that uh, shooting. Uh, there is an awful lot of pressure and a lot and getting back to the the original question uh, there the implication is that police officers have a really dirty job to do they are and, and this is why you know we've got to help them out and, and all of that and I don't think it's because they're they're dealing with the dregs of society because you know, 95% of the people that they in in the, even the, the even some of the high crime neighborhoods 
are good people. You know, police officers create criminals in, in many ways because, you know, we, had a, we, we have an ongoing scandal in Los Angeles about people being put on gang roles that are not in gangs. You can put a 55 year old man who's never been arrested, you're gonna put him on the gang rolls. You know, so it, these, these are good people. I, I think the reason there's high suicide rates, you know, one of the highest profession, one of the, the, the professions with the highest suicide rates and other, you know, alcoholism and so forth is because of the pressure of other officers. I never had a, uh, a mental health problem being a cop. The, the black people that I knew in policing did not have mental health problems because they were not in that inner circle. They were not pressured to do the kinds of things that you see a lot of these white police officers doing. And so I, I think that's where the mental health comes in. It, it's not, you know, most police officers have positive contacts every day. And in fact, the job can be very, very boring at times. Um, but it, it is the pressure of, you know, we need a felony arrest. We need this. We need that. We need you to, to you know, hook some people up and, and all of that. And that's, and, and, you know, you don't get invited to drinking after work with the guys if you don't, if you don't conform. You get your tires punctured if you, if you don't conform. So there's all sorts of pressure, but it's not because they're dealing with the dregs of society. It is not that at all. Uh, I, I have not seen any studies about that, but that's just my sense. I know that's anecdotal, but it's, it is my sense that uh, there, there are pressures beyond, you know, the, uh, the criminals that they're dealing with. There are, um, across, all across the nation, there are failing cities with failing community, communities where um, the police departments in these cities are receiving upwards of 80% of the city's budget, mm -hmm. yet crime is still high in these cities. And how is that justifiable to, to spend that much on police, yet we're seeing no turnaround when it comes to crime? Um, what are we truly serving and protecting? And like Dr. Henderson said, they're getting uh, educated wages. I was, I was a firefighter for 34 years and I'm retired and I'm retired very comfortable. And so the bottom line is, is he's right. They're getting uh, educated wages. They should be educated. And, and, I, and I don't think it's training. I think it's hiring. I do, I go back and say, you've got to hire the right person for the job. And when you start interviewing these people, and I, I will say this here, as I was leaving the fire department, the young firefighters coming in were completely different than the old, old guard. They were coming in, they were very religious. They were family oriented. They didn't hang out and drink with the boys after the game. They went home to their families. They didn't smoke. So the ch there is a change happening in the fire department. Now I, have, I wasn't a police officer, but in the fire service, I saw that change coming on. I thought it was the neatest thing. Look at these young men with, with uh, good ideas and good intentions. Now, as far as police officers go, I don't know. I, I hope it's happening there too. I don't see any evidence of it. I really don't. And you know, there's a, there's a lot of interaction between firefighters and police officers. Uh, they see themselves as the guardians of the community. Uh, albeit, you know, firefighters don't, don't have weapons and that kind of thing. But there was just a, a news item yesterday where a firefighter punched a, 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 a suspect. Um, and I don't know how often that happens, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that you are hopeful about, about the new people who are coming in, Stan. Uh, I'm not so hopeful, though. I think I, my sense is that it's gotten worse, or as um, was it Will Smith says, it hasn't gotten worse. We just have more cameras. Um, yes. So it's always been happening. It's yes. always been happening, and that's why history is so important, right, Jeremy? Um, history is, uh, it, it informs us that modern policing came right out of the slave patrols, came right out of uh, uh, Jim Crow and, uh, and, and, and beyond. Uh, and so, well, they were established to, to chase down uh, runaway slaves. Still doing it. 
yeah, still doing, doing it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys. Sorry about that. I'm still reading the pouring in of questions coming in. So I'm just reading down the list, getting to you guys. Um, uh, one of the questions came in from Dan Brown. Um, could it be that the glorification of rogue police officers and movers in TV that influence people to want to go and be those types of police officers? They, they're, they're, in, they're composed of the same, or, or they are exposed to the same media that everybody else is. So they have their own ideas about, about what police officers should do. I interviewed, uh, I used to interview to hire police officers uh, back in the day. And uh, I remember uh, very clearly this young white man must have weighed, I don't know, 130 pounds. He was really a small guy. And you, you always give them these hypotheticals. And so uh, we asked them, there were three of us on the panel and we asked them, you know, gave them this hypothetical, you're in a bank, there's a robbery, and what do you do? You're armed, what do you do? And of course the right answer is, you know, I get down on the ground like they tell me to do, I, I get a good description, et cetera. And this guy, uh, he actually got up out of his chair and he, took the position, you know, he, you know, faked gun. And he said, I would tell them freeze or your wallpaper. And <laughs> the three of us on the panel <laughs> had to actually leave the room. <laughs> All these years later, I'm still cracking up over this. Needless to say, he did not get the job, but that's what he thought was the right answer that you know we are cowboys out there and we got to get these people in line so i'm going to use my weapon right and i'm going to um i'm going to make mincemeat of him or wallpaper of him you know that's and unfortunately you know the everybody everybody sees the same media cops as as dirty harrys well, the educated pay and that role of a vigilante and then the sad thing is, is coworkers don't call them out. That's what the real issue is, is once you got a guy like that and, and he makes it on the job, you know, he doesn't say that he's always says the right thing when he's in the interview, but when he gets on the job, he's that guy. And once he's on the job, you know, you look at your partner and you say, that guy is crazy. Or you see how he walked in the middle of those, that, those gang members and, and cursed them out and then walked back in his car like he owned the place. Well, you know, as a co-worker, you've got to call that person out. And that's, that's not happening. It's not happening. And what's going to happen when you call them out? You, you're chastised. You lose your job. You lose your job. I always remind people that there were 20-some officers watching Rodney King getting beaten. And how many reported? Two. Two people, two cops reported uh, of the because there were multiple agencies uh, when he was stopped, and two people reported uh, went back to the station uh, and and reported. And they were from different agencies. These two people, a white woman and a black uh, man, um, but most of them, you know, you, you don't get that. You that's 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 a real career non-starter. You don't you you just don't do that. Just don't do that. I can make a comment real quick towards what Mary was talking about with where everybody sees the same media. Um, just to give a, it's anecdotal also, but when I was at Sam Houston, when Howard and I were in school together at Sam Houston State University, um, I just happened to be out in the hallway one day and I was looking at this bulletin board outside the professor's office that um, conducted all the internships and there was pictures of all the ind individuals and what agencies they were with. And out of maybe 20 pictures, 18 were female. And I asked him, I was like, do you remember when the big swing in criminal justice criminology majors took place to where it went from a male dominated to a female dominated? And without missing a beat, he said, Clarice Starling in Silence of the Lambs and uh, Diana Scully, The X-Files was when he, and he'd been doing this for years. And I think, 
I look at our majors at Indiana State. We're the largest major on campus. We are 20, last time I looked at the data, we we're 25% African American, another 10% other minority status. We're 52% female. But of the African American majors, I'd say about two thirds of those are female, not African American males. So I think a lot of this, when we're talking about, you see the same media, are we, we, well, we're not seeing the portrayals in a positive light with African-Americans, et cetera, to where they can envision themselves being that good cop and wanting to go into that career trajectory. Is that, does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Cause I think you're gonna see a lot of swing as far as politicians go because of the Kamala Harris thing. You're going to see a lot of change in politi politics. You see young black uh, girls trying to get into the, the the game because they've seen something that's. I never knew there could be a black fire chief, so I never pursued going up the ranks at a rapid pace because I never saw one. I went to a convention one time and everybody in there was black and everybody in there was a chief. I was shocked. I was late in my career, career and I'm, I couldn't believe it, that these guys existed. And so I, you're right. When you see something that catches your attention, you do follow suit. And, and, and I'm, I'm not surprised that the numbers of females involved in law enforcement are, are as such. And can I just predict? You, you all can write this down. This is a prediction. You can have a police department that's 90% African-American. And unless you change the goals of policing, unless you change the way police interface with the community, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be the same thing. Yes, African-American officers are less likely to shoot an unarmed person, but some of them do. Some of them do. And you, you, if you look at, uh, you know, we've had discussions of police on the reservations. And, you know, they get that badge and that gun and, and that baton, and they do the same thing. They do the same thing. So I, I just, I, I wish I were as hopeful, you know, because if we change the demographics, we, you know, we will, we will see a difference in policing. Uh, rather than tokenism, you know, we'll have a, a critical majority uh, or a critical mass. But I, I just, I think we have to, as we started this conversation earlier, we've got to change the, the, uh, the goals of policing. Is it to protect and serve, as in the white community, or is it something else? I, I think there are other countries we can look to for templates that have changed what you're saying. I think Scotland is one of them that I, I remember hearing about, but you know, the, it's not like this is impossible in the sense that no one's ever done it before. There have yeah. been other countries that have done this. Right, right. I, I think the challenge is that we're gonna have to change the name of police into something else. And that's, Nobody wants to say that, but we, when you hear the term slavery, there's only one thing you think about. When you hear the word Jim Crow, there's only one thing you think about. We cannot continue to use the word policing and expect it to be anything other than what policing is, mm -hmm. right? So we're going to have to... In this country, we can't use that word, and it, you can't fix it, right? Uh, I don't know what that new name is. Maybe we should all get together offline and, and work on that. But I know we're not going to be able to change policing, right? Because I think that's what we have is policing, right? Because it's been that way from the very beginning. Now, I think that I like to think that we want to do that, but I don't think we're going to be able to take policing and make it what it's not, right? Because it's always been that. I don't even think we're gonna be able to use law enforcement because it's been what it is. I'm in Texas and they used to have the word probation and they changed it from probation to community supervision, right? So we have examples in the United States where folks have changed names because they recognize 
that the old name was was it was too much negativity tied to it. Policing just has too much energy that's negative tied to mm -hmm. it, right? Agree. Uh, yes. Those those three little kids that was in that guy's car and saw their daddy get shot by the police. There's nothing you're going to ever be able to tell them if they were of age to be able to remember that that about a police officer being a good person. It's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that if we're going to do it right, we got to start talking about finding another name and, and run with it. Agreed. Agreed. Well, I agree. And I, you know what? I think both of you, Frank and, and Howard, I think what you guys are doing is admirable because that's, got, that's going to make the change. When the, the research, the studies, the speaking that you guys are doing is going to allow for people to listen and say what they're speaking is truth. And truth is something's got to change. And so I, I thank you guys for coming on today because this, this is so powerful and so meaningful because we need to have change. And I think you're right. Policing has got a bad name. It always has and it always will for black people, especially. Uh, and I think one of the points that Dr. Howard made is, I mean, Dr. Uh, Henderson made is, where are we going to go with this forward? Because that's, that's a big question. That's, that's, that's it. And that's the same with this whole series of what we're doing is where are we going to take it? And I think that's really an important uh, question that he asked. Mm -hmm. Uh, Howard, you you mentioned uh, those those little kids. Um, of all of these images that we've seen, that you know George Floyd, um, Arbery, uh, all of these, to me, one of the saddest um, pieces of video was a little boy playing basketball by himself in the driveway of his home, and a cop car comes rolling by and he hides behind his family's car. He hides behind. Whereas if this was a white community, they'd be running up to the car, asking to turn the siren on, asking to have a ride. But this little boy is hiding behind his family's car because he's afraid of the police for good reason. For good reason. Thank you for bringing up. Um traumas um, that are left in these communities and in these families after these um, after these different effects. Uh, also, um, Dr. Henderson, you spoke earlier on, about research, um, especially the, the newer pieces uh, of research, because correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, we're still using 17th, 18th century research that, that, that compels education and employment to this day, um, how we how we handle those different situations. Um, but I, there's a lot of great research coming out of these universities and uh, with these professors that should be applied to today's manners that could better help us. How can we get those type of resources um, to the helm? These should be the new textbooks, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, they'd probably be much better read. Um, I, I, I think that um, uh, Google has to be your friend. And, uh, you, you know, you guys have a wealth of information that can be pushed to your phone. It can be pushed to your computer. Uh, I use a lot of Google alerts, you know, so if it's a topic that I'm interested in, want to know more about it, I go to Google alert and have Google alerts send me emails uh, with everything that hits the press daily. Um, I have mine set to once a day. Uh, if it's really pressing, I let it come a couple times a day. You can set up to come instantly. Uh, so every day I'm getting, you know, anything that hits the web on these particular topics. So like right now, uh, anything that hits the web on police reform, I'm getting. Uh, anything that's hitting the web on, on housing reform, I'm getting. Um, anything I'm getting on student engagement, I'm getting it real time. Uh, so I'm able to kind of peruse uh, the world and see what's, what's hitting in the web. And I mean, listen, you can't beat that. Um, I read, I'm, I'm a huge Reddit fan. I think that Reddit is a great tool. If you guys don't use it, you should use it. It keeps, it's, it's, it's basically peer review for the world. Uh, you get people talking about issues all over the world. You get different perspectives on issues. I, I think the more that we can, you know, spec, you know increase our scope of understanding, uh, the, the, the more we understand that uh, the scope of work that's been prescribed to police officers is too wide, too broad and we got to kind of narrow that back down. 
uh, and be, I mean, keep in mind, I mean, <clears throat> policing as we know it today is, is a direct byproduct of a response to the 1960s, right? So that's how they responded to the civil rights movement, right? And so we got to figure out to create a space that responds to 21st century America. It's a different reality out there. And I think that the more we can get people to read, uh, I think I saw a good video the other day. I saw a police officer who was going to break up a, a seven on seven football game because of Corona, obviously. And the kids challenged him to a push up competition. They said, if you win the push up competition, we leave. We win the party. Then you leave. Well, the officer won the push up competition. But my point is, none of those kids got to worry about that officer ever shooting them because they built a bond, right? And they have a level of respect. I don't care how old the officer gets, how old those kids, whenever they see each other, they're gonna remember each other, right? Th those are the kind of relationships I think that we need to, to begin to build. Unfortunately, we, we're in the uh, gig economy and everybody's on the phone, nobody talks anymore. We gotta get back to that. We gotta get back to people actually knowing folks' phone numbers when you get in trouble. Uh, I'm working with some some brilliant high school kids. Um, they created an, an app that alerts your family when you're stopped by the police. And the app tells your family where you are, and then it automatically turns your cell phone video on. So it re so it, you ain't to worry about it. So the problem is you got to click the button. I said, ah, we got to figure out a way for you guys to know the police are there and they come on automatically. So we're working with them trying to work through that kink, but we, we gotta be creative and use technology to our advantage. And I think we, again, but we need you guys to keep doing more of this kind of work though, because these conversations, man, they, they're critical. They're Thank critical. You. And what you. happened to community policing? That was, that was good. That, I think that was a good, you're right. Because if you know who your local officer is in your neighborhood and you see him drive by every day and and he knows who the knuckleheads are and he knows who the good people are. That that was a, a good idea. Somehow it kind of trickled away. I don't know if it was numbers or, or what it was. Well, there was usually just one person at the station though that's a community police officer. He's the good guy, right? But then you've got 50 others who are calling him, as they did me, communist. So instead of community relations, I was communist relations <laughs> because they did not believe that, uh, that the, the police should be doing, you know, night basketball or going to, to, you know, luncheons or whatever. Didn't believe that at all. So that's your job, Mary. That's your job. And we're going to go out here and fight crime. So I, I, I think um, there have been you know, different iterations of community policing since the 1960s, Stan, and I'm not sure that any of those models work. I think there was some hope in like Seattle or someplace, but that's pretty much an all white community or an all white state. Washington is like the whitest state in the union. And so it's, it's easy to be a community police officer uh, and, 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 to, and to adopt that model uh, but when you're talking about South Central LA, I, I'm not so sure, or, or the West Side of San Bernardino, not so hopeful. I hate to be, you know, um, uh, Debbie Downer here, but <laughs> I think we have a lot of work to do. I don't think we, as we have suggested, I don't think we have the model uh, of what can be. I think, you know, it's it's up to our imaginations what can happen, as long as we we can get our politicians, our school officials on board. Uh, you know, and we have schools that have more police officers than counselors. Um, you know, we've got, we've got some work to do. Thank you all. We have enough time for uh, one more question coming in from our Q&A before we go on to closing remarks. And um, this comment is coming in from Andrew. And it's for um, Dr. Henderson, and I'm sure others could chime in as well. But is it possible that by changing the name of policing or law enforcement, it could cause further frustration because many could see the name change as a way to deflect away from the issues within the policing force? I, I think 
that's possible, but I think in the name change, you also are able to redefine the scope of work. And that's what we want to do is redefine the scope of work so that we can hold them accountable. But it's, it's going to require a Supreme Court to wake up and do something about it. They've been very silent. And I think we understand why they've been silent. Um, we got to go back and revisit this whole notion of probable cause and reasonable suspicion. Uh, we got to be able to deal with police accountability. Um, and we got to get away from looking at officer intent uh, when there's an obvious violation of, 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 of a person's civil and, and constitutional rights. Uh, our system is not based upon that reality. Uh, we assume that people are, um, if people don't mean to harm you, then uh, they should be let off. And that doesn't happen the same way when it's a citizen harming someone unintentionally. A lot of times uh, you have non-negligent uh, ways of, 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 of prosecuting people. I think we need to be able to hold the police to the same standard, but in that, re that new definition, I think we're better able to hold police accountable. And I would add to that list, um, Dr. Henderson, uh, qualified immunity, uh, which is uh, which which just uh, is a is a boogeyman in terms of uh, how police officers get away with the kinds of things they get away with. Uh, you know, we have and we've spoken on this panel before uh, about the the DA uh, in uh, Los Angeles, uh, black woman Jackie Lacey, and uh, and. You know, I kind of hope she loses the election to a white man because she's she's uh, and and he's a very progressive um, reformer running for for the DA. But she has not she has not prosecuted one police officer for use of force uh, in the in the four years that she's been in there. And the black community is all over her. The Latino community is all over her. And that sort of gets back to my argument that you know you can have a white person in the role or a black person in the role, but if the you know if if they have if you've got the same rules, then uh, there you won't see any change. A name change in a sense. I had the, um, the opportunity to speak with the police association um, earlier this year when I was running for office, and. Um, we were talking about, uh, I was talking that, uh, you know, we was just throwing out gestures of how we can um, better negate crime in the communities. And I, I was talking about, you know, putting more patrol officers, I guess they call them uh, peace officers, I, I, I assume, um, in, in different areas, just to show more frequent uh, uh, visibility to officers in, in certain areas. Maybe um, that could be a suggestion to negate crime in those areas, but um, the officer, um, commented that uh, you think these residents don't know the difference between an officer and a, a peace officer, you know, it, it came down to a respect level of what I know I can get away with, with this officer. And I, and I wonder what a name change um, almost um, bring on that same conflict when it comes to, you know, if we, if we renamed all officers, peace officers, you know, would it, would it, would it, put them in a better light with the community as far as uh, their abilities to handle situations or would it uh, bring on a different dramatic role in the communities uh, when facing um, all these officers as well. So um, I just remember having that conversation with um, members of our police association earlier this year. And um, there's, there's many different ways we can, we can practice negating crime, to negate crime in different areas. And welcome back, um, Dr. Wilson. I see you got cut off for a second. Um, I don't know if you heard the question that you had, do you, did you want to chime in on it? But it, um, the question was uh, focused on um, name change um, when it comes to law enforcement and, and um, would it create more frustration with the community, um, basically deflecting, you know, what's really at, at hand here when it comes to law enforcement and the communities they serve. I think it, I, it's going to depend on the, I don't know what was said while I was gone, um, but uh, I think it's going to depend on the community um, in which that law enforcement agency exists or potentially mandated from even above them to where it's all police, all law enforcement has to make this change at once. And that sounds drastic, but I remember back 
uh, the Prison Rape Elimination Act was enacted back, uh, what year was that, Howard, 2003 or so? And part of that legislation forced all, the federal government set their standards. And in, to ensure that all states adopted those standards, they stated that if you do not adopt similar standards to protect individuals, you will no longer receive federal funding of any sort. So there are ways to force it down the pipeline to, to make some changes. Well, guys, I can't thank you enough for joining us today on, on this public, on, on, this, on this very uh, important conversation on um, cops on film and the conversation surrounding uh, race and policing in, in today's society as well. Um, Dr. Henderson, uh, Dr. Wilson, thank you. If I'm ever in Texas, I got to come and sneak in one of your classes, man. <laughs> come down to TSU. <laughs> See what you uh but that's that's very powerful stuff and great work you guys are doing um as well. Um please oh, and a guest asked earlier, is there any way to access that that information on the research that you guys are doing? Um also, and if you would like to chime in on that. So for us, uh, Center for Justice Research dot uh, org uh at CJ Research TSU on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, you can tap into those from any of those angles. We also have a YouTube channel, um, so you can tap into those. But yeah, follow us, join the conversation. Um, and we think through uh, telling the stories of people's experiences in the system uh, on either side, we, we're gonna be able to uh, help address it and provide the evidence to, uh, to make better decisions across the board. Thank you. And most of my research is available online. It's the full text of the articles. Um, and then they can feel free to email me if they have particular questions or want a particular article if they cannot get access to it. It's frank.wilson at indstate.edu. If you guys want to leave that in, um, in the chat for the attendees as well, um, I'm sure they would, they would love that as well. So we've taken up enough of your dinner time. I'm gonna go into uh, you guys are over on the on the Eastern time. So uh, we're gonna go into closing remarks. Um, don't forget, guys. Uh, next week panel will return to our regular Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Uh, we'll be featuring CSUSB alumni. We uh, will have uh, guest speaker um, Dr. Gascon, who's speaking about his book on the limits of community policing. Um, civilian power and police accountability in black and brown Los Angeles. So um, details will be coming up in your um, campus emails if you are members of CSUSB. Um, but besides that, guys, we thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us every week. Coming back to this, uh, this conversation, a very important conversation that seems to be bringing healing to a lot of people and answers to a lot of people as well as they come back each week um, to, to join these conversations. I can't thank you enough. Stan Fudge for joining me, sharing this light with me, uh, my team behind the, the camera that always makes sure audio and everything else as well. All I do is come up and put the handsome face in the camera. So uh, I appreciate you guys as well. Uh, again, Dr. Anderson, Dr. Wilson, I can't thank you enough for this important conversation. Definitely opened my eyes and changed my views as far as, um, you know, what to apply to fight in these different areas. So um, Mary, I see that smile, please give me some Final words. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just I just want to thank our two guests. You all have been um, exceeded expectations. So uh, and and I just love your casual style. And uh, I think you, you know, you realize this was not going to be a conference. This is going to be a conversation. And we so appreciate uh, that you understood that and that you uh, you gave us two hours of your time. And that's much more than than we deserve. So thank you very, very Anytime. much. Anytime. And yes. be safe. Be safe in that 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 Houston bad weather. I got I got relatives over there. So you know keep it away. Keep it away. We'll, we'll keep us in your thoughts. Thank you. Sure thank will. You. Sure will. Uh, see you be all safe next everyone. Week. Next Take Wednesday, care. 4 p.m. Conversations on race and policing guys. See you next week. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Mary, you get that uh, message I sent you? I did not, Stan. What did you say? Well, look at number 40, uh, 440 p.m., the question she wrote down.
uh, in the chat? Yeah, in the chat, 440. My chat is not opening for some reason. Anyway, she says thank you for the discussion. Perhaps in the future, it might be a better, better, better discussion if there are views from the other side of the discussion. This discussion seems to be one rather one-sided. I, I don't agree with that. I, I don't, don't agree with that. You know, we, we have a media that, that you know, the yeah. cops' voices are the loudest. They got the White House, too. And yeah, and, and we have got to show the other side for years has been missing. We have never had conversations like well, that. Well, they need to know what the topic of the conversation is. That's, that's the number one. What do you mean? What do you mean? Uh, what, what, what's, what's the name of this, this uh, meeting every, every week? Well, it's race, race and policing. <laughs> exactly. So obviously the person who wrote that doesn't realize that they joined the conversation in racing and racing. Mm -hmm. If they want another side, they won't. I get see. It. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. No, I, you know, I am not, I, I, I'm, of course, I'm only one voice, but I, I don't agree that we should have chiefs of police on the panel. Because what are they going to do? They're going to they're going to chief of police, right? right? They're they're, they're going to tell you how wonderful their department. You know, should we should we move over, Jeremy? That's a good yeah. idea. Yeah, because I think Thanks. we still have Thanks, some Barbara. participants. Dan, did you get the email to move over? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Through. So why don't we continue the conversation over there? I think it's a great question, Stan. So let's let's finish it over there. All right. Okay. Thanks everybody okay. for joining. Thanks everyone.